1993, New York. A nine-year-old boy, Zach Ibrahim, comes over to his mother to tell her important news he had just seen on the telly about his dad. But the no. woman is too busy writing a novel about the Middle East. She asks him not to disturb her. Meanwhile, in his prison cell, the boy's father is lusting for news from some blind man. And a friend of the family is heading to the airport, trying to leave the US for Pakistan as quickly as possible. In turn, one of his best friends is thinking about getting back $400 he had paid for a rental van. All these circumstances are linked together by a very significant event, which had taken place a few hours earlier. At 12.18 p.m. that afternoon, at the underground parking area in the North Tower of the World Trade Center, a huge explosion went off. Six people were killed instantly. Hundreds were attempting to flee the darkened building, where clouds of acrid smoke were filling the floors. Tens of people got trapped in smoke-filled lifts. The jams and panic has increased the number of injured people to 1,042. The cause of what just happened was unknown. The police had suggested it was a malfunction of the main transformer. Meanwhile, a group of firemen, along with some explosive engineers, slowly sorting through the wreckage, were trying to reach the explosion epicenter. And as they managed to do that two days later, it became clear that the explosion was not an accident. And it was a small piece of wreckage that played a key role for the investigation. A part of the van that had a vehicle identification number on it had partly survived. It was sent to a forensic lab, where the USA's best experts, after a few hours of work, managed to recover the VIN. After 15 more means, they found out the van had been rented from DIB leasing firm in Jersey a few days before the incident, and was then claimed to be hijacked. It could not be anything but terrorism. The authorities of New York announced the highest ever reward in the city's history for anything that helped them catch the terrorist. At the same time, a special FBI agent dressed as a DIB leasing manager was questioning the man who had rented the van and was now desperately trying to get back the $400 bond claiming that the van was stolen. His name was Mohammed Salome. He had been known to the police as a supporter of radicalism, and his excitement at this time was seen as suspicious and he was detained. A search of his home was carried out. But the only thing the investigators were able to find were visiting cards and some notes with the addresses and phone numbers of his friends. They were about to let Salome go when the telephone rang. A man said that he was the owner of warehouse facilities on the outskirts of Jersey. He also said that prior to the explosion, two suspicious men had rented one of his rooms. The owner recognized Mohammed Salome at once. The investigators examined all the telephone calls made from the room's telephone. One of the recently called numbers appeared very familiar to them. It turned out that this number was in Salome's phone book. Nidal Ayat was a chemist and had his own chemical supply company. This meant that a new explosion was possibly being prepared. On the 10th of March, FBI agents arrested Nidal Ayat right in his home while he was having dinner. They found a letter on his PC claiming responsibility for the recent attack. Another letter that Iyad was about to send in a short while told of a new explosion. Iyad's recently called numbers led the FBI to a rented house in Jersey. The house owner confirmed that it was rented by Mohammed Salome and his friend, who had called himself Rashid. The search carried out revealed that this house was a bomb-making lab. The police were focused on identifying all the chemicals used in bomb-making. But instead they randomly discovered the real name of Rashid by finding an asylum application by Youssef Ramzi. The rented house turned out to be a gold mine. Now they knew the bomb chemistry and the three names of people who had made it and put into action. Meanwhile the police were questioning everyone nearby who could have known something. And a few people told them they had noticed a gaudy guy. Again, by examining telephone calls and numbers, they managed to identify his name as Mahmoud Abahalima. He left the United States immediately after the explosion and then was arrested in Egypt. The FBI managed to convince the Egyptian authorities and Abahalima was taken to the US. He confessed that he had met Rashid in a training camp, whose real name was Youssef Ramzi. This name emerged at every stage of the investigation. But who was Youssef Ramzi? He was an international terrorist and an explosive maker. 
It was now clear that he had been in charge of the people who carried out the attack. He left the United States that very day. But how did he show up in the US? In September 1992, Yusef Ramzi arrived in New York by plane, not on his own. He was accompanied by Ahmed Ayaj. The latter was detained in the airport because he had a fake ID and an explosive-making booklet on him. He had been in jail since then and couldn't take part in the attack. Not exactly. Examining the recordings of his telephone calls in jail helped uncover their ingenious plan. Meanwhile, the investigators were able to recover about 70% of the van used in the attack. They had multiple receipts, telephone calls and other pieces of evidence. The trial process had begun and they, having assembled the information piece by piece, were able to explain what really happened that day. In September 1992, Yosef Ramzi arrives in the US and settles with his friend Salome. They both hate Israel, which is supported by the United States. Wanting to take revenge for this support, they make a sophisticated plan. They choose a WTC tower as their target. They acquire the chemicals needed and use a warehouse on the outskirts of Jersey to keep them. They use aliases to erase any traces. But Yusef Ramzi lacks the experience at making bombs that Ahmed Ayaj has, as well as his booklets. That's when he comes up with a triangle connection method. He calls a cafe where his friend Ismail Iyad works, to hide his call from New Jersey. On the second line, Ismail calls Iyad in jail, and after the latter response, he connects the two lines. Ahmed Ayaj gives Ramzi instructions on making a bomb. They all take part in preparing the explosion. Nidal Iyad and his company provide them with hydrogen cylinders that would intensify the explosion and enhance the damaging effect. On the 16th of April, they head to the North Tower of World Trade Center and sketch its building plan. On April 22nd, Ismail Iyad arrives in New York from Dallas to help them accomplish the plan. On April 23rd, Salmi goes to the IB leasing and rents a van leaving $400 as a bond. The bomb is almost assembled, and everything is almost ready. But they need to do something very important. Namely, they have to visit the tower once again and calculate where exactly the bomb should be placed. Their plan is even more insidious than it might seem. They not only plan on destroying one single building. They want the North Tower to crash into the South Tower, so that both buildings turn into ash. On February 25th, Abu Halima and Ayaj finish assembling the bomb in the rented house. The other accomplices help them load it into the van. Then they go to Manhattan and take a hotel room for the night. Mohammed Salome stays in the house and calls the police. He had bought a children's flight ticket and is in desperate need for money to change it into adult one. So he has to report the van hijacking so that he gets back his money from DIB leasing. Everything is ready now. Friday, February 26, 1993, 2 minutes past 12. The van filled with explosives gets onto an underground parking place in the north tower of WTC. At 6 minutes past 12, one of the perpetrators lights up a smokeless safety fuse. Every second the fuse burns at 1 cm. In 12 minutes the two towers as well as all of the evidence would be completely destroyed. 18 minutes past 12. The horrifying plan becomes a reality. The explosive wave is so powerful that it destroys four stories. But the calculation turns out wrong, and the North Tower has not crashed. The same day Yusef Ramzi leaves the US. Ismail Eyad goes to Jordan. Within a few days Mahmoud Abba Halima also abandons the United States. Salome, who is still in the US, is ready to leave once he gets back his money. But a small piece of the van changes his plan. In May of 1994, the four terrorists were sentenced to life in prison. In November of 1997, the last two terrorists, Ismail Eyad and Yusef Ramzi, had also been convicted. The latter will spend the rest of his life in a solitary cell. Only one person managed to stay away from it all the time. Namely, it was Yusef Ramzi's uncle, the blind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was already planning to use planes in a new attack. That was my first Hafez drone story. If you liked it and want to see the next one about the 9-11 attack, please subscribe to this channel. You can also support me on patreon.com. See you in the next video and до свидания.